name is Bernard Müller. I'm the general manager of Genti. I'll not say a lot about the company. We will have, we will see some, let's say, use cases um, where we go into what we do. I want to talk about disintermediation of payments. It's maybe quite <laughs> controversial. It's also um, maybe a big title, but that's essentially exactly what, what we do. Um, and I want to explain to you why we do it, uh, what the regulatory consequences and so on are of doing that, and um, how you could do it too. So first of all, what is payment disintermediation? What I mean with that is that we remove the trust element from the payment or we move it to between the consumer and the merchant or the payer and the payee. Um, so we have no, you know, you can call it whatever you want, scheme, escrow or trusted financial intermediary, but essentially nobody is holding the money in between, just like when we do payments in physical cash. And um, of course, in order to make that happen, it's very important to make it compliant. No payment company can live for very long if they're not compliant. Then you have to have the right technology to do it as well. And then of course, also really important, once you have those things in place, you need to think about the user interface. But we will be mostly focusing on the compliance and a little bit on the technology part today, okay? So you are all payment experts and you have probably all seen the four-party scheme, sometimes more party schemes in and out. Um, but essentially, um, my summary of this is, this is technology of the 60s, um, which has been adapted several times. For example, credit cards for the internet. Today we enter addresses, CVV codes, we confirm it's really secure, and, 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 and. But it remains a pool system. It remains a system where somebody has your data, they can charge you, essentially. And even despite all these security stipulations, unfortunately, there's still um, a lot of nefarious things happening. And uh, of course, because there are so many parties involved, you also have very high fees. And the fees are also in parts coming from the complaint handling processes, the fraud prevention, and so on. And yesterday, somebody said on stage, well, the fees, you know, they're, they're never, you know, they're always paid by the businesses. Well, right, but you know, I still pay them in my consumer prices. If those fees wouldn't be for the businesses, my consumer prices might be lower. So we'll, we'll get back to that. So again, historic context about payment disintermediation. This is literally the first sentence out of the Bitcoin white paper. And it reads, commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. While the system works well enough for most transactions, it still suffers from the inherent weakness of the trust-based model. And the, the author goes on to write about dispute handling, about complaint processes, how it makes it very inefficient for smaller payment, especially uh, casual cash payments. And you know what, what is written here in today's world, that's even very true for retail transactions. Even retail transactions today, we've seen it yesterday, most of them don't really happen cash anymore. They happen also through the schemes. So what would be the advantages for a user to actually um, do direct payments? So the first thing is with cash, you're in full control of your money. Um, you know, you, you, you can always access it. No matter, you can exchange your wallet, you can, you can use a brown leather wallet, or maybe use some kind of whatever else you're using. You, it's your choice. And you can always send your money to someone you want to send it to. You have very high speed and efficiency, you have very good privacy and also very good security. Um, digital cash is essentially a push system. So you say whether you want to give some cash somewhere or not. It's not someone deducting, writing to your credit line or anything like that. Um, you can do very small microtransactions as well as highly automated transactions with it. And you don't have a lock-in effect. So you can kind of you know, choose the wallet provider or the service provider on the a merchant side, similar to physical cash handling, you know, you, you might have 
I don't know, security company A to come pick up the cash and next day maybe you're not happy with them, you, you, you get someone else to do that. And for businesses and merchants, um, you have quite some compliance cost savings potentially, especially if you use it kind of as an infrastructure. Um, it's maybe for the merchants as such less relevant. Um, you, have, you can have a very direct consumer relationship, just like with cash, you know, you give the product or service, you receive money directly for it. Uh, you have very good transparency and also reportability on your transactions, of course, actually much better than with um, physical cash. You have efficient micropayments, instant settlements. Um, so we at Genti, for example, we take the digital money from the merchants every night and exchange it for you know, money on the bank account, the kind of same convenience you would have with Web2 payment solutions. Um, it's suitable for any industry and uh, there are no chargebacks, which is also a really good plus for the merchants. Of course you can give back money, of course you can give a refund, but it, no, nobody can come four months later and tell you like, oh, actually that car had some sort of dent and now I want to file a chargeback for buying that car. So our vision is to make it the norm again that people pay in cash, also in the digital world. And in order you know, to fulfill this vision, our mission is to provide the tools and services that people can actually choose to do that, be it on the consumer side or on the merchant side. Um, but in order to actually fulfill this mission, we first have to understand basically you know, how the payments work today and what we have to change to make that happen. And I'm going to go into that right now. So that's again another representation of the, the scheme model, which you all know, which you've seen before. We have interchange fees, license fees to be paid to the scheme, acquire fees, card fees, and probably a few more if you have a PSP or someone else in, in between. So the money travels very indirectly, <clears throat> also <clears throat> hugely delayed sometimes. Some merchants wait maybe two weeks till they get their money, depending on when the transaction happens. Now we want to see what would happen if we actually you know, get cash involved and say, well, you know what, let's, let's just pay directly. What, what changes in this picture? So first of all, we basically get rid of all these in financial intermediary fees. You know, you could still have an acquirer, somebody helping on that side, maybe there is a fee. So to be fair, we leave that in. Um, next, well, you don't need a scheme anymore. There is nobody orchestrating, right? Anyone can accept the cash, pay the cash, no problem. And, you know, the issuer we could actually call wallet. It's your digital wallet. You don't necessarily need an issuer. You might have a provider of technology that you choose, that you like, and that provider um, is essentially your wallet. And so what we do here is we move the payment from these complicated ways around to this direct transaction. And so we move the trust element there as well. And I just want to be clear, I'm not one of these um, crypto proponents that would tell you, oh, we don't need credit cards, we don't need banks or any of that. What I'm saying is, you know, and, and we, we learned that as well again yesterday, we move into a very pluralistic play payment world. And what's good for you know, buying you know, a few dollars worth of content or a game code on the internet or something like that might not be the same means of payment you want to use to buy flights for your whole family for $7,000. Because there I'm actually quite happy you have those insurances and things and if the airline goes bankrupt I get my money back from the credit card company. Very good service. But I don't need that to buy a chewing gum or certain types of content or whatever on the internet. So by uh, moving that trust element there, we enable a lot of other things. We can now um, start offering services on either of these sites through what I call kind of a service window. And these services are then also very, very direct. And I'm going into a few examples here in Genti, for example, on the wallet side. Um, you know, we provide a wallet free of charge to every user that wants to. It's a user interface service to their own wallet. So we, we know we call it wallet for simplicity, but actually they own their wallet. We just provide them a user interface to it. And now in this wallet user interface, we can offer a service window. For example, our Genty top-ups are here. And we can then offer this service directly to these clients. 
And because it's a direct service and because they exchange their money directly against ours, it's essentially um, you know, money exchange service, very similar to what you do at the airport. There are also um, limits under which you don't actually have to ID the client. So this concept also works for unbanked, for underbanked, for you know, people who like privacy as such. Um, that's all possible. And um, for example, another thing we have coming is a service window directly to a remittance services provider. So people in, in, the, in our app, they can do remittance payments, but we're not a remittance services provider because they are paying that service provider directly. That service provider just gets a window into our app. We never, excuse me, um, what happened now? We never touch that money directly. Likewise, on the merchant side, for example, our merchants, they want the convenience as they have today. They want to have money on the bank account, they want to pay salaries, they want to pay suppliers. So we have fiduciary services, which we offer to them. We take that digital money out of their wallet every night to exchange it for money on the bank account. But again, it's very linear. So we're trying to linearize everything from a compliance perspective and from a technology perspective which really simplifies a lot of the compliance. Um, yeah, I want to also make an analogy here to, to the internet in general, right? In, in the beginning of, you know, early 90s and so on, everybody had their intranet, right? It was the hottest thing. And at some point we realized, hey, actually we can grow faster and bigger and learn more from each other and connect better if you use one open network, right? And we have a lot of these open network standards. We have email protocol, we have TCP IP, and so on and so forth. And you know, you can choose which provider, which gateway you want to use. And this is also what you can do with digital cash. So you can open really the market and Chenti wants to be there because we're best in class, because we provide you know, the best service, the best UX and so on. But the token protocol we use, the blockchain we use, as well as the payment protocol we use, they're all open standards. So anyone else can come and create the same thing, can compete with us, can make it better or provide a different user interface which might apply to different users, right? So this is what I said in the beginning, the user has no lock-in effect for their money. There is no financial institution that can just block it or send it on their behalf or something like that. So I want to move into a world where I, as a consumer, as a user of the money, I choose who I interact with. And it's not kind of dictated to me, you know, based on, on the payment rail as such. Um, so, but let's look at the compliance landscape a little bit. And I'm mostly focusing here on Switzerland. I'm fully aware that um, very similar things are there in Europe, in Mika law in UK, but we cannot go fully into those details. Maybe we can discuss them later. Um, so first of all, financial services directly to a self-hosted wallet, non-custodial wallet, that's possible in Switzerland. That's the money exchange aspect, for example, I mentioned. It's totally legal, it's totally fine to take someone's money and give them digital cash for it and exchange it with them and not have it as IOUs on some sort of system. Um, and such services can even be provided without um, end user identification. You have to have technical measures in place to ensure no smurfing happens, um, you know, that one user is actually one user, but you don't have to banking grade ID them with video identification and all the other things we have to do here in, in Switzerland. So um, if you keep those limits to those limits, you, you can basically almost have full automation. And you know, these are really two differentiators against other rails you might see um, with what we do. One is that it, it is available to unbanked and underbanked people. There is no like, you basically need a phone number and an email address and that's it. And of course, if people want to transact more or have more services with you, they have to identify, but not for sort of the base level. And it's highly efficient for micropayments. So we've just shown, um, 1.2 million transactions in a day, we had an internal cost of $5 for that. Um, and this was one cent transactions each, you could imagine with a card scheme, pay maybe $150,000 for this, for 1.2 million transactions, depends on how big transactions are. With Ethereum blockchain or so, it would, it would be a few million. 
Um, and so these are really the two differentiators. With, when you use radical digital cash, you can serve unbanked and underbanked, and you can really do micropayments highly efficiently. Um, and also, you know, no, I think nobody really wants to, in the next seven to ten years, use native Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Ethereum, whatever to pay. Yes, maybe a few nerds like myself or someone else in the room might want to do that, or when you know the markets are trending really high and people want to spend their money, but it's not working out for a sort of consistent business. It's not really these, the value add for the everyday person, right? If you want that, you need essentially fiat money on the blockchain. And that's also what we have done with the Centi Franc, which is fully backed by Swiss Bank Guarantee. Um, it's, you know, it's essentially a stable coin which is really guaranteed, so if, even if the issuer goes out of business, um, then you'll still get your money back from the bank, which I think is quite important to, to create trust. Um, yeah, and then with this, what I showed you with these service windows, you can heavily modularize your services and, you know, you don't need to, let's say, have everyone going through the same onboarding process just to then use one service. If they just want to use a service that has this low KYC standard, you can serve them there, modular. If they want to use something else, you, you serve them somewhere else, you might do another tier of identification and so on. Yeah, um, I'm not going into like UX design and so on, but UX is of course very, very important for adoption. We have some <coughs> great UXs out there in the schemes we heard yesterday, like Twint, Ideal and so on. Of course, uh, this can all be replicated as well and, and done with digital cash. Um, and um, there are also challenges like, you know, on blockchains, you have those transaction fees and people are confused. What is this even? So we pay that for all our merchants and consumers. If you have you know, 20 francs, you pay five, you still have 15. That's how it should be, that's how it's logical for everyone, that's how everyone can actually comprehend. These are a few things we do there. I'm not going to into detail here. Um, so there's huge potential for financial inclusion to serve customers or clients you're not serving today. Actually, for example, this target group I told you about, about 350,000 people in Switzerland, 22 million in, in Europe. Um, so, and, and of course, more and more, you cannot actually buy anything anymore if, you, if you're not into this digital finance world, right? There in France, for example, there are a lot of shops, they don't even accept your cash anymore. You have to have a car. And this is coming more and more. And you can very efficiently monetize content, creator economy, sharing economy. Uh, even Elon Musk talks about this, adding micropayments to Twitter to prevent bots and spam. Um, you could get rid of Cloudflare and CopJas with micropayments. Just imagine somebody has to pay five cents to connect to your website. When they disconnect, they get it back. How expensive it's, it becomes to open several million connections to you. So the challenges we have to overcome, um, we have to basically address certain misconceptions about digital cash. For example, a lot of people say, oh, the fraud rate will go through the roof and so on. Actually, that's not what we're seeing, because if somebody has to actively send money or give you money out of their pocket, they're much more careful than clicking on some link or some phishing guy tells you you have to confirm your email account, uh, eBay account by clicking here and using your credit card and things like that. Um, of course, the stability, we address that with the Chanty Frank stablecoin and, and others that are coming. Um, and of course, you need to have strategies to build trust to the consumers and you know get them on board. So what we're do, what we're doing right now is we're very much focusing on making the app we have as something which is value standalone. So no matter how many merchants you already have, we have 350 in Switzerland right now. You know it doesn't really matter. The value has to be there standalone, so people can do remittance payments or a virtual credit card and other things in the app then. Um, yeah, and our goal is really to make sure people choose that route, not to force it on them, not to make them use it, so they have a choice, and if we make those products great, they will actually also choose. Um, yeah, and I would have maybe two minutes, one minute for a question out of the audience, if there is any. Sure. So. Um, when I worked on one of the schemes, we had a big sign in our office that said, 
let's not become the next Kodak because of this intermediation. Yeah. That's exactly what you're doing, right? It, well, yes, I, I, we're just really trying to provide an alternative to debit and credit and, you know, and, and get out these real advantages which you have if you use that versus the other methods. And what, and what kind of reaction do you think you'll get from some of those old established players? Or, or do you see that we talk a little more about cooperation? Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. So, we, I mean, we, we allow credit card top-ups in our app. So we want to be, of course, very um, complementary to the current financial intermediaries and financial system. So we also want to interact uh, and make sure we have very good, you know, on-ramps and off-ramps to our app. Um, as well, and so, um, you know, that's also why we're here to connect with all of you and you know extend that reach. Hi, uh, my name is Stavros. I come from the high risk industry. So when you mentioned uh, um, privacy and uh, no identification for some uh, transactions, it could it could also mean like a lot of people from the high risk industry could abuse the system. What? What um, actions are you taking to prevent that? So we are a duly regulated financial intermediary here in Switzerland. We have AML audits and so on. And so we, we're, you know, everything we're doing is of course within the law. We're taking actions mainly to prevent people to circumvent the limits that we have. So the, the, the app itself, you know, you could send two million Swiss francs to, to your colleague or also to a gambling site, we cannot prevent that. But in, where we act as a financial intermediary versus the client, we make sure that we adhere to these standards. We make use of these exceptions in the Swiss anti-money laundering law where below certain limits, you don't need that. But again, you need to have technical measures in place to ensure that a user is a user. But otherwise, we're really open also to high-risk industry, especially for them. It's really interesting to not have chargebacks, to uh, you know, to <laughs> to basically know I have the money when I collected the money. That's what everyone wants, right? Let's go. <laughs> yeah, let's do. There are no okay. further. Oh, you have a question. If you if you know the fact that I'm from the central bank. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we talked yesterday. Yeah, we, 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 talked, we talked yesterday, so he doesn't feel threatened by it. But, I mean, obviously, how would your business model be affected by and whenever CBDCs are introduced? Um, so how, are you, how are you preparing for that? Hopefully, that would be my hope, the CBDCs are also based on open standards, and we could just include them. All right? that's, that's, uh, that would be the best and most simple thing to do. We would include it as on-ramps, as off-ramps, or maybe even directly in the app. Um, we'd love to. One more question. Thank you. Um, you mentioned before about uh, the bitcoins, like Bitcoin and Ripple. Ripple has also plans on entering CBBCs. So how do you see that? Well, again, I think. There is, so, so one thing is we're mostly a payments and payments technology provider and the, the currency, the stable coin we have, we, we have done it because we need to give people something which is stable, but it's mostly an infrastructure project. So if other people also provide this infrastructure, again, we're more than happy to, to integrate, to, to see what it is. What's really important for our use cases and our compliance, I couldn't go into that in detail, is that it's truly considered a payment token, digital cash, and not some sort of security or securitized asset, because you know that would make us, for example, exchanging the asset on the merchant side again for money would make us a security stealer, which we're not. So we, you know, we need to make, ensure at our current regulatory setup that everything we exchange is considered money. Well, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I'm looking forward to chatting with you later a bit more about that. So let's give a big round of applause, Bernard. Thanks Thank you so much. Thank you. Feel free to visit our website and talk to me on here in a moment.